Hello, everyone. Today on The Final Bar, we will break down these markets from three main areas. We'll talk about the big picture, the top-down macro, the S&P breaking down through the 200-day moving average, following through to the downside here on Monday, February 14th. We'll talk about sector rotation, energy, and everything else. A lot of other names starting to struggle as well. Financials pulling back off of recent highs. Also, shifting stocks. We'll get some individual names on the move. Ladies and gentlemen, this is The Final Bar. Hello, everyone. Welcome to The Final Bar. I'm your host, Dave Keller. I'm the Chief Market Strategist here at StockCharts.com in a cloudy Redmond, Washington. Thanks for joining us every weekday after the close as we focus on the markets using the language of technical analysis, using technical and behavioral techniques to better understand what investors are doing, to focus on the message that the markets provide back to us in the form of price and derivatives of price, things like volume and breadth and sentiment, trying our best to understand these markets in very uncertain times. There are a lot of competing narratives uh, today and uh, and in recent weeks. Over the course of just this morning, I've been talking with uh, with peers and others about uh, you know Russia and Ukraine and uh, and that whole uh, you know escalating conflict, what that might mean for energy prices. Um, just looking at equities and how they're uh, how they're trading around key levels. The S and P getting below its two hundred day moving average. Inflation data from the end of last week and just the prospects of, uh, of the Fed and the pace of rate increases through the course of the year. So, and that's not even getting into things like earnings and what companies are actually doing with their businesses, supply chain issues, all of that. So there's so many competing narratives. And, and I've always tried to remind people in times like this, when it feels like there are so many potential uh, you know, narratives that could impact stocks, at the end of the day, focus on price. A price will tell you the aggregate result of all of those narratives, and most importantly, how investors are pricing those narratives in to the uh, to the equity prices and asset prices. We have great guests on the show. Last week, we had a lot of fun with some really good guests, Sam Burns and, uh, and uh, others, uh, Carolyn Baroden and others that did a really good job with us. This week, more good guests for you. Tomorrow on the 15th, we have Jay Soloff from Investors Alley. On Wednesday, Sean McLaughlin, the uh, Chief Options Strategist at All Star Charts, will be joining us. Then Thursday, we have a guest host. I will be taking off heading to Ohio to visit some family. We have Julius DeKempener from RRG Research, who's going to be uh, hosting the show this Thursday, the 17th. Also, our next episode of The Pitch is coming up on February 25th. That'll air at around 11 a.m. Eastern. Uh, Grayson Rose from the Stock Charts team, team will be uh, moderating a discussion with John Kosar from Asbury Research, Mark Newton from Fundstrack Global Advisors, and Tony Zhang from Options Play. Should be a lot of fun. It's a really good event. We do that about once a month. Uh, it's coming up on uh, the 25th. Go to stockcharts.com slash the pitch for more info on that one. Let's continue on today's show with our market recap. As I mentioned, the S&P sort of rolling over today. Uh, we'll get to a chart of the S&P here in a moment. I just want to update on where things were at. It was, it was really a choppy day. Out of the open, we sort of followed through on the distribution that we saw on Friday going into the close. Tried, you know, attempted to get above Friday's close around 44.20 right around lunchtime, but ended up uh, rolling over. The S&P settling in right around 4,400, and that's down about 0.4% from Friday's close. The NASDAQ uh, actually finished flat for the day. The NASDAQ composite, same uh, close as Friday. Mid caps and small caps all down around the same as the S&P. So no real you know, cap tier differential, right? No, no, you know, certain parts of the equity market, besides the NASDAQ doing a little better. Other than that, um, size-wise, uh, fairly constant across the board. And the VIX going higher yet again, nearing 30 this time from below. Interest rates push higher essentially for, for most of the day. They kind of came off uh, in the afternoon, but in the end, finishing higher. Ten-year yields right around 2%, sort of went, went uh, all around there and settled in just below the uh, the 2% level, which is an important one. Uh, the uh, dollar index, by the way, up about a quarter of a percent if you use the UUP. 
Gold and silver both higher and really all the commodities essentially uh, higher today. Uh, you know, the conflict that we're seeing, uh, you know, brewing in, uh, in Ukraine and in Russia and, uh, and, uh, and, and the West, uh, certainly, you know, what, what is the potential impact of that? I mean, my initial reaction, if there is a legitimate impact, if it really does escalate, would be higher oil prices. That would be sort of like the standard thing about conflict in an area where there's a lot of oil. That tends to be a reasonable expectation that, uh, that you'd have uh, prices go higher. And today, the USO was up about 1% uh, from uh, from yesterday, from Friday. Cryptocurrency is mixed, to be honest with you. And uh, But Bitcoin and Ether, the two that we tend to track the most, both up today. Bitcoin about a third of a percent. It's from yesterday, by the way, and Ethereum up about uh, about 1%. Ether around 2,900. Bitcoin tw- uh, 4,200. Let's look at a chart of the S&P 500. So, you know, Friday, the close was pretty meaningful in that we closed below the 200-day moving average. And what we've been talking about on the show for the last couple of weeks is what I've called the range within a range, right? You have this broader range with these shaded areas, sort of 47 to 4,800 on the upside, 42 to 4,300 on the downside. These are well-established areas of support and resistance, levels that the market has tested a number of times. The more you test a level, the more you confirm it. And, and I was taught early on, once is chance, twice is coincidence, three times is a pattern. Once you test a level three times or more, it really just confirms how that's a meaningful level for the markets. And both of those levels, the support level around 42 to 4,300, the resistance around 47 to 4,800, both have been validated over three times in both cases. So I think that's the broader range. Now, in the last couple of weeks, we've settled in, or we had settled into a much shorter range all playing off of the Fibonacci levels. And my guest last week, uh, Carolyn Baroden, if you missed that interview, is her first time on the show. Really cool discussion about Fibonacci retracements and some of the uh, the objectives. I encourage you to check that out on our uh, stock charts on demand, stockchartstv.com, uh, because it was a really good discussion. And, and one of the things we talked about, just key Fibonacci levels for the S&P. If you take the high in early January, the low from mid-January, 38.2% is right around 44.50. That's uh, been hit a couple times uh, with the S&P's uh, prices. 61.8% levels around 44.90. That was tested a couple times here uh, in the uh, in the last couple of weeks. My comments about a week ago was one of these is going to happen. We're either going to break above the upper boundary or break below the lower boundary of this little range. And I would expect whichever way, whichever way we break, we continue on to test the extremes there. And we broke down through the lower boundary on Friday. We followed through a little bit today, which tells me to be on, you know, to be thinking more bearish, to be thinking more uh, cautious than optimistic, to be thinking more about potential risk than uh, potential reward and uh, and make sure that stops and uh, profit taking is uh, all updated uh, in case downside triggers are, are reached. It's worth noting again, just the momentum picture and how every attempt that the S&P has made to go higher has essentially been met uh, with weaker momentum. The RSI remaining below 50 is not a constructive pattern. The RSI failing to get above 60 on a rally is certainly not a, uh, a bullish pattern. That's more of a bearish configuration. That's where we find ourselves. I'm looking down to this 42 to 4,300 at least. That's a 38.2% retracement of a much larger move and that uh, up to the uh, the previous levels of support from last fall and last month in January, all sort of coincided that 42 to 4,300 level. I think we get down to that area and we reassess and see where uh, where things are at. Now, of course, as that market, as the market would deteriorate, if it would deteriorate further down from where we're at, and today we saw a bit of a, of a, of a drop in that direction, you know, you'd start to think about how that will impact particular stocks, particular sectors, particular themes. Looking today at the S and P and and the uh, and the uh, sector data, only one of the S and P sectors really finished in the uh, in the green. It was the XLY. If you look, all the biggest gainers, many of them, in the uh, in the consumer discretionary sector, and it's things like uh, Tesla, right, an automaker, uh, things like Expedia, LVS. These are all consumer names that are. Uh, that are holding up there pretty well. Another others in here and other sectors represented, but uh, consumer names overall uh, faring pretty well. And if you look down here, uh, things like uh, Amazon obviously up today, and these are these are pretty uh, you know large cap, mega cap names that uh, those being higher are certainly going to uh, going to be a positive boost uh, for uh, for the XLY. So Amazon, one of the the biggest gainers within the uh, the six fan mag stocks as well. 
After that, you sort of drop off. Growthy stuff was at the top of the list. The value-oriented stuff at the bottom with energy down the most, down 2.3%, followed by financials and real estate and healthcare all down about 1%. A little later in today's show, when we get to our segment on shifting stocks, we're going to pick on a couple of those themes in a little more detail. We're going to look at two of the FANG stocks, Netflix versus Facebook. We're going to look at energy and some of those names that have been a little uh, overextended. We'll also look at some financials uh, as well. Our second segment today is called Sector Setups. Now that we've talked about this big picture environment, the S&P breaking down on Friday, not really getting a, a bounce today, but continuing to push further down this really along with the market trend model that I uh, that I talk about uh, at least once a week turning negative a, a couple of weeks ago, all sort of telling me to think more negative than positive. What does that mean for the, uh, for the sector relationships? Well, let's look at the RRG, this is the relative rotation graph. I mentioned Julius DeKempener is going to be hosting the show on Thursday. I would encourage you to uh, tune in for that. He is the master at uh, all things rotation, asset rotation, but also sector rotation. Be very interested to hear his take on what's happening, uh, given the markets, uh, you know, dropping off and breaking down through short term support and what we're seeing uh, at the sector level. You know, if you look at the long term data, if you look at the weekly data using the RRGs, these are really longer term rotations. It's all based on relative strength. So it's basically how The 11 sectors are all performing on a relative basis relative to the S&P 500, which is right at the crosshairs in the uh, the middle of the chart. Energy for some time now has been the outlier. Um, If you look at performance year to date of the 11 S&P sectors, it's been energy and then everything else. If you look at the RRG, it's certainly a very similar sort of take. You have energy. The, the big outlier, the, uh, the, you know, by far the strongest sector out of the uh, 11. That's been building for some time here. On the daily RRG, you're seeing some strength in energy as well. But on the weekly data, particularly the, uh, the long-term data, you're seeing energy as the strongest performer. And you can see that by the fact that it is heading northeast, by the fact that it's in the leading quadrant, it's furthest to the right. All of those things tell you this is a strong sector that is outperforming. And you're getting a bit of a pullback on some of these energy uh, stocks today. Absolutely right. But overall, their long-term trends very much remain, broadly speaking, remain uh, in, in good shape. Now, what looks pretty strong after that? We have to go in the leading quadrant to the other things that are furthest to the right. Things like consumer staples, utilities, financials, probably out of all of those heading in the be- in the strongest direction, right? So it's energy Financials both heading northeast, strongest uh, you know movement, but also consumer staples would probably be a close third, I would say, given the fact that it is heading in the right direction, sort of uh, east northeast, and uh, and continuing to push to the uh, to the right side. That shows you it's outperforming. Now on the opposite side, which sectors are underperforming? Technology, consumer discretionary uh, stand out as two uh, you know weaker parts of this uh, of these eleven S and P sectors. Technology had been in the leading quadrant, now rotating in the weakening quadrant. Consumer discretionary firmly in the lagging quadrant. It's the only one out of the 11 S&P sectors uh, down there in the leaking quadrant. So when we think about that relative performance of consumer discretionary versus consumer staples, we looked at that ratio, I think on Friday, that was one of our three and three, was the ratio of consumer discretionary versus consumer staples overall has very much been uh, been uh, favoring staples. You can see why that's happening or how that's also playing out on the RRG. You have staples going uh, northeast and heading in the leading quadrant. You have consumer discretionary southwest in the lagging quadrant. So it's a clear differentiation there uh, from the more defensive side, which is working, versus the offensive side, which has not been working uh, within consumer. Now let's look at the 11 S&P sectors using the candle glance function. This is a great way, by the way, if you were looking at a list of any tickers, right? A list of ETFs, your portfolio, a list of 11 S&P sectors like I'm doing here. You just want to throw the charts up all together so you can look and it's called candle glance because the original idea was you have a candle chart on each one and you're glancing literally at each one. You're starting to see which uh, charts look similar, which look different. What are the outliers? What are the strongest? What are the weakest? And I found putting a bunch of uh, tickers up here on the candle glance and just noting the tickers that uh, on a piece of paper, the ones that you want to dig into a little further is a fantastic exercise. You want to take a group of things and turn that into a list of actionable ideas. This is a really good way, good way to do it visually. So my question, as you're looking at these 11, this is 12 charts actually, because you have the S&P as the last one. Which of these stand out as performing fairly well, right? Which ones are heading up and to the right? Which ones are above two upward sloping moving averages? Not many. And if I try to answer that question, I come up with two. I see energy, which is you know by far the strongest. And again, if you look at these 11 sectors, you can see why energy is doing so well year to date. This is something that's accelerating really, you know, first quarter breaking out of the 
uh, above the highs from uh, from the fourth quarter of last year and and brief pullback in January, but overall continuing to pound away higher highs and higher lows. It's a really strong chart. You have two others that are sort of testing their 50 day, you know, maybe uh, still above them in the form of uh, financials. I think consumer staples just broke below its uh, its 50 day here uh, in the last a uh, couple sessions. So overall, I would say energy, then financials, then consumer staples, if I would just have to rank uh, the four of these in terms of their overall uh, trends. On the flip side of that, which ones are breaking down? Which ones are showing concerning deterioration in uh, in prices? Well, you can see why communication services is by far the most negative outlier. Look at this consistent underperformance, consistent rotation lower. It actually first broke below its 50-day moving average back here in September of last year, from there has been trading downwards and has had a number of failed attempts to even get above its 50-day moving average. None of the other sectors look quite that negative in terms of its inability to or, or its ability to just have a persistent uh, downtrend. Then you have some other things that are sort of at some concerning levels. I'm looking at industrials that are testing support here from uh, from the last uh, eight or nine months. I'm looking at real estate just getting below its 200-day moving average. Same with materials, technology, consumer discretionary, healthcare, utilities. These are all stocks that are at or near their 200-day moving average. Many of these, like industrials may be the best example of this, have actually broken below their 200-day and are now testing it from below and failing. These are continuing to roll uh, to roll over. What's interesting, we'll have to leave it here on the chart of industrials. What's interesting on the chart of the XLIs, look at the support level around 97 to 98. We have bounced off of that one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, call it nine times this week. We've tested this level so many times. And, and the good news about that is we're not breaking down. The bad news from my perspective is if we do finally break down and we show that that support level does not hold, then what? And that's what could happen. That's what a, a, a further deterioration in equity prices would look like. Stock charts like the XLI are no longer able to hold support. They start failing. And then I would argue we need to look out below. We need to think about further downside protection on sectors like this and what that means for the broader uh, equity markets uh, as well. So I'd encourage you to take a look at the candle glance uh, pages on the 11 S&P sectors and, and, or any other tickers and really start to think about which charts are working, which charts are not, and make sure you're positioned relative to what you just learned. We need to take a quick commercial break. We'll be back with our next segment, Shifting Stocks. We'll see you in a minute. Hey there, welcome back to the final bar. This is Dave Keller here at stockcharts.com. Thanks for joining us every weekday after the close for our show. A couple of quick comments before we get to our next segment. First off, we welcome your questions. Feedback on your host, absolutely. Feedback on our shows, our guests, all of that is very welcome, but we most appreciate questions you're running into as you are trying to analyze your own charts. What questions are coming up about technical analysis, market history, technical indicators, particular charts, ETFs, whatever it is, we're here to help you. Our email is the final bar at stockcharts.com. We're on Twitter at final bar SCTV. We're on YouTube. Put a comment below the video you're watching on our Stock Charts channel. We'll gather all those questions and hope to answer one of yours on the air in our next mailbag segment on Tuesday's show of this week. Also, go to stockchartstv.com. That is our on demand platform. It's completely free. So much great content every trading day. Guests like Carolyn Verodin. Uh, Sean Cole, uh, uh, um, uh, Jay Soloff, and so many others uh, sharing their uh, expertise. Also, our special events like the Pitch, our Market Outlook special from uh, from January, so much more. Go to StockChartsTV.com, use your email address to set up a free account, or on any of the app stores, just search for Stock Charts TV On Demand. Our next segment is Shifting Stocks. We've now talked about the big picture, the S&P breaking down through support. We've talked about sectors how energy overall has been the strongest uh, sector by far, but many others, uh, you know, really breaking down through key levels like the 200 day or testing support like the uh, XLI uh, bouncing off a, uh, a key price level. Now we talk about shifting stocks, which is looking at a number of individual names and themes. I just want to start with GM because this is one of the names that uh, that came up earlier today as I was going through a, a bunch of charts. 
Uh, you know, when I'm looking at uh, the uh, s- sectors and the groups that were actually performing well today, automobiles was one of the better performing Dow industry groups, up one and a half percent. So I was looking through some of the names like Tesla, Ford, GM, and the chart of GM is an interesting one. You know, when you look at a lot of these charts, it reminds me a lot of the uh, XLI. At this point, the S&P has pulled back a decent amount from all-time highs, right? From 4,800 down to where we're at around 4,400. Uh, you know, an 8% drop, we'll call it, uh, back of the envelope from, uh, from all-time highs. We're looking at, um, you know, some of these other sectors, some of these sectors that comprise the S&P that have pulled back as well, right? So you have uh, GM coming down from around 67, we'll call it, down to 48. It's about a 20% drop in uh, in about six weeks. That's uh, that's not an insignificant amount. But here's the thing, bouncing off of support, or, or I shouldn't necessarily say that because it hasn't really happened, but we're certainly testing support. We are currently at the lows that we established last August and September. This is when uh, you know, GM came down uh, from June to August of last year, similar sort of pullback. And then we spent a couple months then recovering back to those all time highs, just barely made a new closing high and back down and now we're testing support again. So this could be a broad basing pattern where we have a consistent resistance, consistent support. And at some point we break out to the upside and that would indicate a much further, uh, you know, stronger upside potential from there when when buyer p- buying power is finally able to push uh, the price to new highs. However, we're at the lower end of that range right now. And what concerns me about this market is the fact that charts like GM are testing those previous lows. We are not too far off. We're one big down day away from this being a huge breakdown. And the, the problem with that is the general uh, measurement technique you do is take the height of that pattern and add or subtract it. You add it from a to a breakout level or you subtract it from a breakdown level, which means back of the envelope, If you take the height of that pattern around, we'll call it 20 points and you subtract it from there, that gives you an objective down in the 28 range, which is taking us down to, you know, last uh, September of 2020, actually, it's taking you down to those uh, to those long term lows. Now, that's just a quick uh, analysis using the height of the pattern, but it tells you how close a lot of these charts are from, you know, looking, uh, you know, questionable to all of a sudden, you know, unquestionably negative. And and that's how, how close I think we are to. Um, this market taking a, a much deeper downside turn. And again, there's a pro, there's a possibility that you have significant downside from here. And, and now is the time to start paying attention to that and start planning for that. Don't wait for something like GM to break down to figure out what you're going to do about it. Now, when I'm looking at the six fan mag stocks or the FANG stocks, I just want to relate two of them to one another. Two of these uh, gap down recently, Netflix with the gap uh, down here on earnings. And then you have uh, Meta Platforms, Different type of look, but but similar in terms of a downside gap uh, recently uh, here with earnings. Now, look at how the two of these charts have performed since that uh, gap lower. That is super not what I wanted to do. Sorry, Netflix. Here we go. Look at what happened with Netflix, right? You had the gap lower. You went lower one day, but pretty much that was the low. You then bounced higher. And we had this uh, um, uh, you know, distribution pattern here. We rallied up to almost 460, came right back down. And now we're sort of at the middle of this range since we established that uh, initial gap lower, right? We gapped lower. We had the bounce higher. And now we're sort of in the, in the middle of this range. If we can establish a low around here, if we you know, hold support and you see a rally off these lows, this could be a higher low with the uh, potential uh, implication that we continue to go higher from here. At least you have a support level to uh, to base it off of. Compare that to meta platforms, which saw the gap lower and really has not bounced that much. We had like a day of a, of a higher close here, getting above 230 uh, last week. I think that was Wednesday of last week. But from there, we're again making a new closing low uh, for this move. So one of these stocks trying to stabilize, the other one not. And and as you have a lot of these names that are breaking down and 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 approaching key support levels, it's all about which ones are able to hold and 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 indicate that buyers are coming in and buying on the weakness. And I think you you may be seeing that with Netflix. I, I think it still has a little bit more to prove and really a more established higher low would be would be meaningful there. On the chart of meta platforms, you're really not seeing it yet. You're seeing a chart in distribution mode. You're seeing the gap lower and then just further downside follow through. It hasn't been able to put together two straight days of a higher close yet. You're just continuing to push uh, lower. So until I would, I would always mention something like a, a sign of accumulation, some indication that buyers are coming in and not just on a one day thing, but actually providing uh, a, uh, a a a period of accumulation, indications of uh, of uh, of broader demand. I think this is a chart still in uh, in distribution mode, still in a, in a negative phase. 
you know, energy, as I mentioned many times, has been the uh, the strongest of the 11 S&P sectors, and it's not even close. And when I'm looking at the chart of, uh, of COP, I think this is a great example chart to tell you what most, most of energy looks like. If you ask anyone who's been investing for any period of time about, t- you know, about having, uh, you know, stocks and sectors and groups that have had good runs, they will all tell you, absolutely, something that's had a really good run, it feels overextended, totally reasonable that you get a brief pullback. As a matter of fact, you know, since the you know fourth quarter of 2020, you've had a number of times where COP has had a, a big push higher and then had like a month or two pullback. You saw that in March and April of 2021. You saw that July and August of 2021. You even saw that going into the end of last year. And every one of those times you've put in a, a, a new low and then you kind of rotate back to the upside. And that's sort of been this stepwise pattern. Look how similar these pullback periods have looked on the chart of COP, but at the end, it's always netted out to a positive move. So you have the fact that it's coming off of all time highs here. You have a hammer candle, sorry, excuse me, a shooting star candle. I almost uh, just completely butchered candle analysis. It's called a shooting star candle where you have a open and close at the lows and a higher uh, shadow there uh, indicating upside exhaustion. You have a bearish momentum divergence with new highs into February and lower peaks on momentum uh, you know, all of those suggest after a really good run, it's due for a pullback. And I think that's absolutely reasonable. The good news is it's currently at 91. It could get down to 80 and, and still be above its 50 day. Um, that's uh, what, an 8 to 10 percent pullback off of uh, off of the all time highs, maybe a little bit more than that. Not a bad pullback within a uh, and, and still would appear to be in a long term uptrend. So I think things like energy actually have room to pull back and the trend will still look fairly constructive. I think energy could certainly finish the year as one of the stronger sectors and, and certainly going forward uh, appears to be in one of the best positions in terms of strong price and strong relative. My point of this example is to show that charts like uh, COP could pull back to their 50 day, pull back to the most recent swing low around 78 and still be within a constructive pattern. I think that's most likely uh, what we see here, given the weakness that we're seeing across the board in uh, in other places. That's all the time we have here for shifting stocks. I'd encourage you to always use the, uh, use the scanning engine and other tools to better identify names on the move. We need to wrap today's show. Go to the three and three today brought to you by Tradier Brokerage on Stock Charts ACP. Look for the little arrow in the bottom right corner of your screen. That is give you the ability to trade directly from Stock Charts using Tradier Brokerage. The three and three chart number one, the S&P 500 and the percent of stocks above their 250 day moving averages. Worth noting on Friday's close, the percent above their 200 day dipped below 50%. I just want to spend a brief moment on this chart because we're going all the way back to 2009. This is using daily data, but I'm going about 14 years back just to show you what has happened when we've gotten below this 50% level and stay there. You have a couple times here, like in 2014 and 2012, where you briefly got below it and went back above it. Those ended up being very viable dips. But when you remain below there for any stretch of time, those ended up being the most significant drawdowns. And notice how long it took for the uptrends to continue. Every time, of course, the uptrend has continued, but on average, it's taken three to six months, uh, if not more, uh, to actually rotate around here. The shortest one was in 2010, ended up being more of a time correction than anything before we resolved to the upside. But this is a very choppy period. Other ones have had much deeper drawdowns later uh, after you had that initial break below 50%. This is why this is such an important chart, I would argue, to watch right now, because you can see the brief pullbacks have had the uh, the syndicate remain above 50% or just touch it or spend a few moments, if any, uh, below the 50% line. The ones that have had more protracted time below 50% have been some of the more painful, drawn out corrective periods. And that would be the risk, uh, the, the more days we spend below 50%. Railroads are one of the better uh, groups today. I thought UNP was an interesting chart to highlight here. Within industrials, industrials as a whole are struggling a little bit. Just like we talked about with energy, I'm concerned about the bearish momentum divergence. You have this going to new highs in January. And just like the S&P, lower and lower momentum. All of that adds up to an increased likelihood of further downside uh, here. With chart of UNP, I'll be looking at these previous lows. It's actually held support right around here. It's about 238 to 240. We break that and I would be concerned about further downside potential. Finally, the ARK Innovation Fund. Uh, one of my guests last week, Sam Burns, was looking at the long-term performance of uh, ARK Innovation Fund versus other uh, sectors and showing the deterioration in the price action, which I don't t- disagree with. One thing I noticed looking at the chart of ARKK is a potential bear flag. That's when you have a big run lower, you have this sort of parallel uh, move back to the upside. If you break below that lower trend line, 
that measures a lot lower, actually down to the March 2020 lows. Folks, that is our show. Thank you so much for joining us every weekday after the close for the final bar. For StockCharts.com and Redmond, Washington, I'm Dave Keller. Be safe. Have a great night. Hey, Grayson Rose here with Stock Charts. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, consider giving it a like down below. Maybe leave us a comment. And if you're new to the channel, you can subscribe at the link up above. We're going to bring you daily content from an incredible collection of technical analysts and financial experts.